What's up YouTube and welcome to my next gamer pro tip video. Today we're going to be doing a little bit of arcade repair on a Sega 16B uh, PCB and this was Sega's preferred port format before they went to more of a JAMA format um, on some of their arcade boards. This actually does not have a, a JAMA harness on the end, you have to use an adapter to hook it up to a JAMA connection. Uh, this was a very popular format uh, that they used for several of their games in the mid to late 80s and we're going to be looking at Shinobi today which is a game I've wanted for my arcade collection for a long time. Recently picked this up uh, through eBay and unfortunately a rather, rather unscrupulous seller sold me a dead board that was not disclosed and when I uh, complained about the situation he threw it right back in my face that it wasn't his problem. So. I had to search out another solution and I found a company called uh, SegaResurrection.com that um, sells replacement ROMs and uh, main processors that you can replace on the board because this is one of those arcade boards that has a suicide battery in it. And unfortunately that's my suspicion is that this board has done its little suicide trick to itself and that is what is giving the board a completely dead um, signal whenever you plug it into a cabinet. So just to give you a little bit uh, more detail of what the makeup of the board is, you have a motherboard and a daughter board here, and this top board has all of your game ROMs on it, and two of these need to be replaced uh, just due to the design of the board that they communicate with that suicide battery that's in the main processor. So the whole purpose of this kit is you get two replacement ROMs that are, have the game data on it, and then you get a new processor unit uh, for the board that doesn't have a battery in it to take care of the battery problem. So just going over a little bit more of the architecture here, this is your Hitachi FD1094 processor that has the suicide battery in it. Um, it's actually under this plate here. If you look very closely, you can even see some of the acid leaking out from underneath the plate. So obviously it has served its time um, a long time ago and it has passed it. Um, this is not uncommon. Most of these boards would be dead by now. This one actually still does have the original piece on it. It's never been replaced. And that's why we need to use the replacement uh, that does not have the battery installed. So just going over some of the tools we're going to use today for this job. Um, this is my first time attempting one of these repairs, but luckily Sega Resurrection has included some nice instructions inside the kit. Um, so we're going to leverage those first and foremost. So you can kind of see the stuff that was included in the packet here. It has some good step-by-step -step instructions. I think I have a pretty good grasp on what I need to do. Um, just looking at other tools for the job, here's the pieces of the kit that it came with. So this is our replacement um, CPU, however you want to call it, for the board. Sorry, I'm not the most technical person. But this is going to replace uh, the piece that has the battery in it on our dead one. This one does not have a battery, and in conjunction with the new game ROMs, it will still be able to communicate. Uh, these are the two game ROMs we're going to replace that are very specific to the Shinobi revision of this version of the board. So that's why it's very important that you're very clear to Sega Resurrection exactly what uh, chipset you're working with so that you get the correct replacements. So with these two replacements installed, as well as uh, this piece, in theory, we should be all good to go. <laughs> um, just a couple other tools we're going to use today. I have uh, what's known as a IC extractor, just kind of these little tweezers that you can use that can pull uh, the ROMs off the board a little bit more easily. Um, one of the beauties of this setup is that these are not soldered in place, so I don't need to do any desoldering, which is always a relief because I'm not really a big fan of it. Uh, but ultimately, we're going to use that to pull the originals off of there. And then just in case we have some that are a little more difficult, I have a thin flat, uh, flat uh, head screwdriver just to use in case we need a little coaxing, especially on that main processor chip that's pretty big. Um, another tool we have today is some Yingling. Uh, it's one of my favorite beers that unfortunately I can't buy here, but I have some that I brought over from the East Coast. And uh, that will help us along with the process today too, I'm sure. So I'm um, just going to go ahead and get started here, just to be specific on what we are replacing. Um, the chips that the package comes with are actually labeled with exactly which ones you need to replace. So if you look here on our uh, original game ROMs, we have EPR11280, and we're going to replace that with 11280, and it's also conveniently labeled A1 to signify this is the first chip in the A run of uh, ROMs. The other one we're going to replace is 11282, which is A4. So we're going to go 1, 2, 
skip the blank one, four, and then that number will match up. One, one, two, eight, two, A ends in the A4 position. So basically we need to pry this one out and we need to pry this one out and eventually pry out this monster and uh, reinstall the new chips, being very careful not to bend any of the pins. And then hopefully uh, we'll hook all this up into the setup and be good to go. So I don't know how much of this I can do because I am filming one handed. I'm probably gonna break here in a moment uh, just to get this process started. But we'll try our hands at at least removing uh, one of the EEPROMs while I have you on here. So again, this is my first time doing one of these jobs. I'm going to try doing it by lifting from the edges here. And this has these, sorry, I should probably show my tool, has these little two picks on each end that you can kind of get around the EEPROM and see if we can get a good grasp on it. I don't know how well this is going to work, so I may need to cut with the camera just for a moment to pry on that a little bit. I feel it coming a little bit, but it also is not very easy because I need to study the board. So bear with me here. I am going to cut. Um, ultimately, if that doesn't work, I'm going to use the screwdriver and use that to pry, but I'll be back with you here shortly to give an update. All right, so just a short update here. Um, sorry, I didn't have to cut. It definitely required two hands just to hold the board in place while I pried um, using the extractor tool to get those ROMs out. Uh, overall, very easy. They lifted straight up, um, no problems once I had the board steadied. So just to show you where I'm at with progress, um, we have removed this one here, um, the 11280, and I went ahead and go ahead and, uh, and popped in one of the new ones right here. So our first one here, the 11280. We're gonna do the one that goes in slot four next. So I've removed the 11282. I positioned them right above where I'm taking them out just again to reduce any um, chance of making a mistake about which slot they go in, especially because you have open slots on the board that don't even need a ROM. So I wanna be very careful that I put it right in the right slot. Um, one other thing to call out, this is in the instructions, just to make sure that we are doing it correctly. There is, focus, a little notch on that uh, top end of the ROM and that does need to stay in that same orientation. So if you look at the bottom, it's flat. On the top, you get that little tiny notch. So we wanna make sure that that faces the same direction, just like the original did. And that's why, again, I've got it lined up just to make sure I'm not gonna make a mistake. Uh, the most thing you gotta be careful with when you're installing the new ones is that all the pins and the legs go in directly into the board and you don't bend anything. The good news is if you do bend something, you can always pry it back out and bend it back into place. So we're gonna go ahead and try Get this one out of the way. We're gonna go ahead and try to put in this one here um, while I'm on camera, just so I can show you how easy that is to pop in place. Uh, let me not look with the camera and actually look with my eyes. We're gonna line it up first before we put any tension on it, just to make sure it's gonna seat. Okay, just checking the one side and then checking this side. Sorry, this is much easier if you're not holding the camera. I should've just got my tripod out. All right, that seems pretty good. So I'm just gonna do another little quick look-see before I tighten that down. Um, it looks like it's seated. Okay, so I'm just gonna apply a little pressure and seat that into place. Um, this is so much better than having to solder all these little bitty legs in place. So I'm really liking the, <laughs> the thoughtfulness of Sega that their stuff was gonna break and people were gonna have to replace these at some time. So I feel pretty good about that. I think that one popped in, seems nice and even. So we are essentially done uh, with replacing the two game rounds. So I'm gonna go ahead and put those to the side. We don't need those anymore. And you can see the replacements in place. Again, they're numbered, so it's really hard to make any mistakes and putting them in the wrong slot. Just kind of follow the instructions and you should be good there. Um, next, we're gonna turn our attention to our Hitachi uh, to get this out of place. I know I'm gonna have to cut on this because this has about a bazillion pins and I wanna be extra careful getting that out um, and also not getting any battery acid on my finger because I know there's some, like I said, that leaked out on the surface here. So again, bear with me while I cut um, and I will try prying that one out. I may need to use the screwdriver with that one. I think that just due to the size of that, um, I'm gonna need to get under it pretty good just to get that pried out. Uh, but essentially we're going to do the same process here, pry that top uh, piece out and then drop our new one in place. So again, bear with me while I cut. Okay, so uh, that actually pried out rather nicely. Um, again, I would recommend using the flathead screwdriver 
a little bit more effective just because there's so many little legs on this one. Um, did bend a couple getting them out, but it's not a big deal. At least I didn't break any in the board. That's the most important part. Um, this <laughs> had another little treat waiting for me is once I started prying that up, I told you there was that battery underneath the cover. Um, you can see there's even more of that yucky battery acid on the outside. So good thing I was being careful. Um, don't want to get all that on my skin. So I've got our new one in position. I haven't pushed it down yet because I need to be extra careful that this goes in um, and I don't bend any legs. But the other call out again is we have that same notch right there that needs to face forward, um, if that makes sense. And then you can kind of just verify uh, the old one was a Hitachi, the new one's a Motorola. Just that the text is facing the same direction, then that should kind of get you lined up there. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start to work this in. And I may have to cut again just if this doesn't go in easily, but there's an awful lot of legs here and I don't want to make any mistakes. So just lining up one side and try to coax it in gently. Let's see how much this wants to cooperate. So far seems pretty good. Just applying a little pressure, not forcing anything. Just to make sure it seats. Checking the other side. That felt kind of satisfying. So you can kind of just feel it when it pops into place. I think we're good, honestly. I'm just kind of double checking. I don't want a bad test just because it didn't seat correctly. So I'm just making sure that's all the way in. Okay. I feel pretty good about that. So um, next up. We are going to get uh, to hook this up, see how it worked. Um, I do have the Sega 16 to JAMA adapter that we'll need to hook onto our harness because just remember again, this is not a JAMA hookup uh, that they used on these Sega boards. But I do have the adapter plate that works with uh, a JAMA connection. So I'll be attaching that to the board and uh, we'll plug this into the Sega candy cabinet and see how we did. So hopefully this is going to resurrect, as the brand says, my Shinobi board, which I really hope so because I love this game. So bear with me one more time, I'm gonna hook us up to the cabinet and see how we did. All right, so we are ready for our moment of truth. We've got our three new chips installed. We've got our board hooked up. We've got our um, adapter to hook up to a JAMA harness, all in line, plugged into the candy cabinets. So let's power on and see how we did. Got a light on the board, that's good, it's getting power. Go up here to the screen and look at that. We have a title screen. We have sound. So just another call out, I guess, on these Shinobi boards. Mine was completely dead, but another symptom that these have is they'll lose sound before they lose video. So that's a good way to tell that your battery is dying and is about to suicide itself completely. Uh, but even doing the same repair I just did will fix a Shinobi board or 16B, uh, Sega 16B board that is having sound issues. I just wanted to call that out too. But I am very excited. This is a game I've always wanted in my collection. I've got it all up and running. We were able to save it, which is always a win. So I'm going to play some Shinobi. Uh, big shout out to SegaResurrection.com for the parts. Easy install. Did this in about 10 to 15 minutes and we are all good to go. So thank you for watching. Please take a moment, like, comment, subscribe. Let me know what you think. And I will talk to you soon. Have a great day or night, wherever you are.